Okay. Well, hi. My name is Merle Friedrich, and I work at the German National Library of Science and Technology, short TIB. Um, and uh, today I want to talk to you how we monitor the risk of obsolescence in our audiovisual holdings. And a word of a warning, I will not talk, I will talk about file format obsolescence and not about carrier obsolescence. As a short overview, I will first start with the definition of obsolescence and then continue with the pros and cons of normalization. Um, then a short look on the theoretical background of uh, preservation planning. And uh, then I will show you how we monitor the risk of obsolescence with the help of UPATH. And uh, I will close with some words on migration. So the first definition, um, obsolescence is the ph phenomenon that occurs when information stored in a particular file format is no longer accessible using current technology. Um, I also found a second definition. Obsolescence describes a state of becoming obsolete rather than a state of already being obsolete. So this definition shows also that we need to act before the information is inaccessible. Um, I like to think of obsolete file formats as file formats that are at risk to become inaccessible by our designated community. I think it is important to also think of the designated community because if we have a film stored on a DVD and neither our users nor uh, our institution has a DVD player, then it is obsolete, no matter if there are tons of DVD players outside. So this is why I want to focus also on the designated community. Um, yeah, and the example with the DVD also uh, applies to file formats. So, okay, how do we save our files in the archive from becoming obsolete? Um, I first want to give you a short overview about the different file formats that we have in our media asset management system. What you can see here is that we have plenty of formats. We, I have extracted uh, the container information, the video codec and audio codec information with the help of media info. And uh, then I made the calculations and I found out that we have plenty of formats. What you don't see is like the long tail of formats that we have less than 20 times in our archive. Um, on the other hand, more than 70% of our archive are in the first three formats, so this is why I will concentrate on them. Yeah. So what about normalization or normalizing them? Um, there are advantages of normalization. If you have a limited set of file formats in your archive, then it makes validation easier if you have the tools for it. It makes preservation planning easier because you only have like this limited set of formats you need to look at, and you need less tools in general. But there are also disadvantages. Um, someone has to migrate the formats that come into the yeah, to the preferred preservation format, and so this migration is necessary by the producer, and this leads to undocumented changes of the material. Um, and also the delivering of material is unattractive because the producer first has to work on it before he can hand it to the archive. Um, so this might also lead in loss of information for the archive. Um, or the, the archive itself could do the migration, but this leads to high workload on the archive side. And uh, if you want to keep the original for authenticity purposes, then you need more storage space. Um, I did a short uh, test with a sample from our AV holdings. And uh, so they are all lossy codecs, as you've seen. And if we migrate them to FFV1 and Matryoshka, so to a lossless codec, um, then it takes up to 10 to 20 more times storage space than the original. So this is also a question of costs and storage space. So sometimes we just have to take everything we can get just the way it is. We start in our archive, and after a few years, boom, it's obsolete. 
no, don't worry. <laughs> um, that won't happen. Um, we have a strategy for that. And this is, this is where I would like to look again into the open archival information system and preservation planning. Um, well, this is the OIES with the functional entities. I'm quite sure you all know about it. So archive has six core functions coming from the ingest, data management, and archival storage to the access, as well as administration and preservation planning. And preservation planning stands in contact with the producer and the consumer and the administration of the archive. Um, one important or important task for an archive within preservation planning are technology watch, community watch, and preservation watch. Um, technology watch, there an archive looks at the formats and how they develop. It looks at the tools for the formats and how they develop. And it also um, looks at how, if there are known errors, for example, from scanning software or yeah, file formats in general. And then there's also the component of community watch, where an archive looks at its, its designated community. So um, the users or the library teams in our case. Um, so everyone that works with the audiovisual material. So what formats are widespread there? Um, how are they used? Are they only watched? Are they edited? What for are they needed? And what metadata is important? Um, technology watch and community watch can be extended by preservation watch. So this also means performing risk analysis, having a test, but saving information on executed preservation plans within the archive and monitoring the risk of obsolescence. Um, how do we do that? <laughs> well, Ryan compares file formats to species and file format obsolescence to species extinction. She conducted and evaluated expert interviews and compared 21 indicators um, for file format obsolescence. And uh, she evaluated them with the same methods that are used for species extinction. She comes to the conclusion that the only factor that can be considered a direct cause to file format endangerment is rendering software available. There are secondary factors like specifications available and the community or the third party support. But really important thing is rendering software available. So this is the, this is the one point we need to monitor if you want to monitor the risk of obsolescence. Um, and how do we do that? Well, the uh, National Library of the Netherlands uses this concept of view path for each format. A view path consists of three components. There's the hardware platform start, the operation system, and the software and version with which the format can be rendered. So um, the National Library of the Netherlands has at least two valid view paths for each format. And this is what I wanted to achieve, too, for our formats. So I took the, the three most used formats inside our archive, and um, yeah, I tested different view paths. Um, what you see here, for example, is the container MP4, the advanced video codec, and advanced audio codec in version 4. And the first view path consists of the Intel Core i7, uh, so the computer processing unit. Uh, Windows 10 as system operation, and Windows Media Player version 12 as software. Then uh, I checked, uh, well, this is, of course, a view path that is accessible within our institution. And the other view path as well, which, which consists of Intel Core i5, Windows 8.1 Pro, and a VLC media player version 2.2.2. What was important to me is that they are, the view paths are independent from each other. Is the, if they both rely on the same hardware platform, and we don't have them in the archive anymore, then both of the view paths are not valid anymore. And this is what I wanted to avoid. So this is why they are independent from each other. We can also save this information within our archival software. 
We have the farm and library, what you see on the left, and uh, there we can store the formats we have and the related applications with, with whom they can be displayed or rendered. Um, and we also have an application library where we can store information on the application, for example, the software version or the registry type. We could also store information on the support end date, which might be important if you have prop proprietary software. And we can also enhance it with local fields. And this is where I've put the information on hardware pl platform and operation system. So um, if one of these components is no longer available within our institution, then we can test if there are other view paths available for the same format, or we have to migrate to a suitable format. Here I come to the migration. First, we have to decide for a format, and uh, this can also be a really hard task, and depending also on the institution within your working. Um, there are five most common criteria uh, amongst literature, and these are adoption, so if a file format is widespread in the community or also within the archive. Then technological dependencies, so if the file format depends on special techniques like hardware or software. Then we can also look at the transparency, how easy is it to identify the file, and uh, how easy is it to check its contents. Disclosure has all to do about documentation, is it freely available to the archive, and the metadata support, so which metadata is embedded and is the metadata that I need most embedded there. But there are also plenty of other criteria which are applicable, like costs, re reusability, robustness. Um, and the choice of criteria and the weighting in between them is also depending on the preservation policy of an archive. And it also can depend on the collection. So maybe you have a part of the collection where reusability is really important and another part where it's only important to yeah, render it. Um, then I wanted to test the preservation planning within our our archiving software, which is Rosetta. And well, upon ingest, we extract the technical metadata and we can generate automated risk reports. For example, based on view path, but we can also use other, other technical metadata. Um, we can then create sets on the base of the risk report, or we can refine them with additional technical metadata or depending on the collection where it belongs. Um, we define evaluation criteria. For example, that the display aspect ratio stays the same after the migration. And we define a tool for migration, which can be internal or external. Then we run a test and analyze the results. This, this can also be automated. So for example, for the technical metadata, which is extracted, it can be an automated test. Uh, or manual, if you have some tests that you can only perform manually. Um, in the end, when we are, when we are, when the test is successful, we can sign off the preservation plan and actually migrate the collection, or we can refine it again. So, what I want to do in future work is develop a migration plugin for our arch archival software, so that we can migrate to FFV1 in Matroshka with the help of FFmpeg. Um, and this is how we tested the migration before actually the file formats are obsolete. Okay. Then we have here some references. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? You've mentioned the, the view path. Um, wouldn't, what would be if you would not go for a view path, but a transcoding path? Like what you mentioned yeah. was like, okay, so you can view the material, but if yeah. you would replace this with like 
transcoding pass, what about this? Sounds like a good idea, really, because, well, you have to think of the migration, of course, so it makes sense to think of how to migrate it. Now. Thanks. Thanks, yeah, thank you <laughs> for the inspiration. Any other questions? I love I love the idea of keeping lo like local data sets of your you know risk components and profiles and systems and applications, but I, I also love the idea that I heard a few years ago, maybe last year, about a linked data repository to keep similar you know store. Have you have you come across that idea? Have you been in think? Have you thought of that instead of storing it locally to store it in a linked data environment? Yeah. Um. I actually think that there have been some um, some trying to do this, but I haven't stumbled across like one where you can actually find mm -hmm. the view path or something else. Um, within the Rosetta community, the format library and the application library are interchangeable with the other institutions, but yeah, that's it would be nice to. Uh, share it with more institutions. Given that we heard yesterday that um, we are now sort of um, um, figuring out uh, older co legacy codex faster than they're created, um, how much effort should we as a community still put, do you think, in sort of monitoring the obsolescence? If, if everything will remain tran transcodable with FFmpeg. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's not, I, uh, I mean, I don't, I, uh, I don't mean that in a mean way, it's just something <laughs> I, I sort of wonder myself. Yeah. Um, I think, um, well, when I was looking at the literature, it was really like, it's not a question anymore, I think. It, there was more research like 10 years before. And, uh, but nevertheless, I think it should be something that we keep in mind. Well, yeah, but I don't have a definite answer. <laughs> uh, may I answer the question? Yeah, please. <laughs> Better be safe than sorry. <laughs> yes. yes. Okay. Thank you very much.